Well, welcome, welcome. We're going to let folks uh, just uh, come into the uh, room. So we'll give folks a, a couple more seconds as we gather and I will do some uh, introductions. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome everyone to this presentation and discussion of the work of W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, his data visualization. Uh, absolutely stunning work done at the turn of the 20th century. And I know for uh, I know for certainly those of you who have not encountered the work, you're really in for a treat. Um, it's a it's a wonderful experience, and we have uh, two wonderful guides to take us through. Um, I'm Michael Diamond. I'm the academic director of the Integrated Marketing and Communications Department within our divisions of business, the division of programs in business at the School of Professional Studies. And I'm particularly delighted uh, to uh, not just to welcome you all, but also to be celebrating uh, Black History Month uh, with this event. And there are obviously a number of events going on across the school and across the university in celebration. And indeed, I was struck uh, honestly quite recently by some comments uh, that Bob Johnson made. Some of you may know Bob Johnson was the founder of the uh, TV network media company BET. And I thought he very thoughtfully said that, you know, he, he was concerned that Black History Month ought to focus on the future, really need to focus on the future and to look, to quote him correctly, to look at what's needed to deliver equal opportunities moving forward. Uh, and he went on to say that I think that we need to make Black History Month, not just history made, but history in the making. And I, and I think that's a, a really a good way to sort of contextualize what we're doing today. And I know that Jason and Lillian both will probably get into a very rich discussion around some of these aspects, uh, not just about the history of, of data visualization, but some of the impact it continues to have and continue to, to have. So, so let me introduce briefly our two speakers, and then I want to uh, spend a little bit of time, a little bit of time uh, talking about the school and some of the analytics programs. Uh, so you get a sense, some grounding in, in what all uh, we're doing here. Um, Jason uh, is the director of, of, of interactives at McKinsey, uh, and he's been working on an extraordinary body, body of data visualizing uh, what's been going on with, with COVID-19. But he's also the co-founder of Nightingale, uh, a wonderful publication from the Data Visualization Society um, and uh, published now on Medium and uh, really one of our uh, sort of leading lights and writers and thinkers uh, in the data viz space. I, I, I would describe him as saying he has the taste and the, curat the curatorial passion of a true connoisseur. And it's definitely always uh, a pleasure to, uh, to learn from him and to hear from him. So I, I hope you join me uh, in that appreciation. Uh, Dr. Lillian ajayi Orr. Uh, who I'm very proud to call a colleague here at NYU School of Professional Studies. Uh, she uh, teaches in our integrated marketing uh, and communications department, uh, you know, part of the divisions of programs in business at the school. And she uh, is not only a data scientist, um, she's a writer, uh, and she also is a, a chief learning officer uh, and a graduate of an amazing program at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in a very unique program in, in, in that space. And, and I, you know, I can't begin to tell you how much I celebrate her involvement and her engagement uh, with our community sort of writ, writ large. So um, I advance a slide if you wouldn't mind for me, uh, Bonnie, or, and, I, and it's a good opportunity for me also to give a shout out to the sort of people working the magic behind the curtain, uh, Bonnie Bergen and Julia Potapoff, from the department who, who make these things run smoothly. Um, very, very quick intro to uh, NYU uh, School of Professional Studies. Uh, it's over 85 years old, long, rich history of being highly engaged in the professional education of New Yorkers and increasingly the globe, um, you know, following our campuses around the world in China and Abu Dhabi and, 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 and other places, uh, West and East. Uh, very innovative uh, as, as a school, uh, very focused on uh, applied uh, professional knowledge. And uh, I, I may have missed it at the very beginning, we, we, we flashed up a sort of the new mission, which centers on the idea of, of, of transformative uh, learning experiences steeped in real world applications. So, you know, this is a school I think that kind of uniquely in many senses brings the applied and the theoretical together. 
Um, and then, of course, you know, we have this wonderful uh, base location in New York City, which, you know, even uh, despite COVID and, and, and the, the value and importance of working virtually and working globally, you know, a lot of faculty, a lot of thinking, a lot of students, a lot of the professional communities that we serve are attracted one way or another towards New York. So it's, it's a very powerful base for us. So what I actually want to do is give you um, uh, a little bit of a, a story of some of the other programs uh, that, that are teaching analytics and visualizations. But just before I go there, I, I would like to uh, shout out uh, to some colleagues. Um, uh, another, another note of delight to say that we're able to present this program, uh, you know, with the participation uh, and you'll see latest, you know, sort of with the scholarship and the teaching and the pedagogy uh, of other individuals ar around the school. Um, we uh, were, were pleased to be able to partner with Dr. Brandon Brown uh, from the Preston Tisch, um, Preston Robert Tisch Institute for Global Sports with Dr. Chris Gaffney from the Jonathan M. Tisch Center for Hospitality, um, with Dr. John Kane from our Center for Global Affairs, and with Dr. Tim Savage, uh, who teaches in the Shack Institute for Real Estate. Uh, and each of them are very engaged and active in their own scholarship and teaching through an approach that I think we probably all acknowledge um, as something uh, which certainly in our department we like to call human-centered and data-driven, yes? And this is very much, I think, at the heart of how we approach much of our teaching, our thinking, and our scholarship. Um, and it enables us, I think, to give a very unique experience to the roughly 4,200 students of the school um, with about 1,300 faculty supporting them. So, you know, it's a very rich, diverse, um, broad, engaged place for professional education. Uh, a quick word, you know, for me, I, I am I am besotted by data visualization. I have literally uh, fallen in love. I'm, uh, you know, happy to and proud to wear that badge. Um, it, for me, it has a certain visceral uh, capacity to combine both aesthetic and analytic qualities, which sort of play to certainly both side of my interests, but I think to to many of us, it, it, it links the what we call in marketing sometimes the magic and the meaning and does so in this very powerful uh, and provocative way. And, and, and we teach this sense of data storytelling throughout the school, both, both in the sense of you know, how to derive really actionable insights out of data, but then also how to ensure that all of your scholarship or your work or your storytelling is grounded in data, grounded you know, in, in the facts. Um, and so I want to give you a very quick tour of a few illustrations of courses that are offered at the school that involve data. And it's a highly select list. Uh, I, I guess I like an Oscar's acceptance speech. I'm going to leave some people out that will later tell me I shouldn't have. But uh, let me give you a quick story. So if we flip to the next slide, um, if possible, within the department, and, uh, within the division of programs of business, are actually three large areas, one's marketing, one's HR. Uh, one's management systems technology and a fourth is project management. A, a small highlight, you know, we'll send this deck around to people later. You don't need to read the details, but within the, you know, the discipline of marketing, we have a master's of science in, in marketing. Some of the core courses include, uh, you know, uh, marketing analytics as a concentration. We're teaching business analytics. We're teaching data visualization. We're also teaching, you know, advanced statistics. So we're teaching, um, web SEO analytics etc so there's a lot of work done around the analytic side of marketing uh, we have a wonderful new program uh, which I think uh, many actually on this call may be drawn from the ranks or interested in the whole idea of human capital analytics which is an advancing space and I we have you know I think what's an extraordinary program uh, at the school put together by Anna Tavis and her team in human capital analytics technology. They're teaching storytelling. They're teaching important things like um, algorithmic responsibility. Um, press on if you wouldn't mind. Um, in, in, I talked about this uh, school, uh, you know, that we have around hospitality and tourism. They offer, among other things, a, a master's of science in global hospitality management. In those courses, uh, I think I referenced Chris Gaffney's work. You'll see on the right-hand side, he built this extraordinary global tourism uh, risk index with illustrative case studies, and, and we'll send you links for that. 
they're teaching data analytics for that industry. They're teaching generalized data analytics and business modeling courses. Likewise, in our global uh, affairs program, there is actually a specialization in data analytics that I believe John uh, Kane, who's on our panel with us or, or with us uh, on this call, uh, leads. And, and as I, I may have mentioned to some of you, he also was one of the lead analysts in the most recent uh, United Nations uh, 75 reports and, and survey, a massive uh, piece of work and undertaking uh, that was published last year. So, you know, data analytics is, is suffused not just in classic business uh, disciplines, but also in topics like global affairs. And, and then just to sort of round things off, I think uh, we have one more, may have one more slide to go in here. Yes, so um, our Institute of Real Estate, the Shack Institute of Real Estate, which I think is potentially one of the oldest, certainly one of the most distinguished departments within the school, um, has uh, a program, uh, a master's in real estate among the courses students will take are things like analytical techniques used with investment analysis, uh, very specific data, data analytics applied to real estate. Um, and, um, and Tim was kind enough to share some of his Python output with me here on the left. So I, I thought I'd flash that up. And then sports, sports even, uh, uh, we have a, a really well-established sports program. Actually, the unit is, is led by a man many people may know through Sabermetrics, a man called Vince Gennaro, who was the president of uh, the Sabermetrics Association and, uh, and certainly you know, as, as analytical as any of us. Uh, there are actually courses in sports analytics um, in, in the master's program, but there are courses about the science of fandom and there are courses about you know, blockchain, et cetera. So it's, it's, a, it's a program uh, and more broadly, uh, you know, a school, a set of degrees, a set of faculty, who I think very committed to this uh, blend between the human centered and, and, and the data driven. So I think, um, I think really uh, without further ado, probably what I, I should do uh, is do my job as a moderator or a host and, and, and send us on our way and uh, really hand things over to Lillian. Um, what I would ask you only is anyone who wishes to ask a question, uh, you'll notice at the bottom of your Zoom panel, uh, for those unfamiliar, there's a little sort of bubbles that says Q&A. If you type your question in there, uh, Lillian uh, and or I uh, will we'll review the questions towards the end of, of, of Jason's presentation and we'll attempt to you know, take on any questions we can. So we run for an hour and a half. Uh, you know, I think uh, Jason has about 35, 40 minutes of presentation. We'll have some discussion. We'll have some Q&A. And certainly we can hang out at the end if anybody is interested in talking a bit more about the program specifically. Uh, that's, that's not the main intent, but you know, if, if you have questions, we can hang out. So uh, Lillian, without further ado, I'm, I'm handing things back over to you and Jason. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again, Michael, for the warm introduction. Jason and I have a smashing presentation for all of you guys today. Um, Jason, again, thank you so much for being here and sharing this insights with us. We are excited to get started. So um, as Michael mentioned before, uh, Jason Flores is the Director of Interactives at McKenzie and Company. So Jason, my first question before we dive into your presentation is, um, can you share with us the kind of work you do at McKenzie? Uh, sure. Uh, so <clears throat> technically, I'm the director of interactives for the COVID Response Center, not the director of all interactives for McKinsey. There's probably some toes being stepped on with that one. But uh, regardless, uh, the COVID Response Center is a different way for McKinsey to kind of share its expertise kind of publicly. And our group specifically uh, creates interactive data visualizations exploring uh, what they call saving lives and saving livelihoods. So effectively, healthcare data about COVID and also kind of economic, the economic impacts of the pandemic. All right, thank you, Jason. And then one more question before you start. What can we expect from your presentation this afternoon? So I actually used to be a musician uh, in a previous life. And when people would say like, what kind of music do you make? I would say like, it's gonna change your life. It's gonna be the greatest concert you've ever seen in your life. And I love that kind of hyperbole because of course it just smashes expectations down to zero. Um, but what I really am deeply passionate about, I think as you'll all see, is this work by Du Bois is still emerging into uh, further study research and to a degree even, you know, making it into the canon of how we teach data. Um, it's deeply important for me to see this work more widely uh, studied and recognized. 
And I hope that this is just an introduction to that, to that journey that a lot of us are hopefully can continue to pick up from here and, uh, and drive forward, so. Conversation. Everyone, I just wanna say again, just to illustrate what um, Michael said earlier, if questions do come up as you watch the presentation, feel free to drop us a quick chat or do a Q&A prompt if you want. And then at the end of this presentation, after I've asked some of my own personal questions, uh, we will take on the Q&A from everybody else, all right? Jason, you have the floor. And we're excited to see this presentation. All right, thank you so much. So uh, we've touched on this just a little bit. I'll just go back uh, and retread a little bit. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Michael and Lillian. I think that the work of Du Bois, of W.E.B. Du Bois, is actually a great way to think about real world impact uh, from your notes, Michael, and also uh, actionable use cases. And I, I hopefully you'll see that I'll kind of frame that as we go. Uh, I'm here in New York. I'm just up the street from you guys. Uh, super pleased to represent New York City and NYU uh, at this lecture here at NYU. Uh, uh, delighted and thank you so much for ha having me today. Um, uh, as Michael said, I'm also the editor in chief of Nightingale, uh, nightingale.com. We'll put, send a link. Uh, I want to just take a moment and call it out. We are a, uh, a free publication um, uh, that allows uh, all kinds of practitioners to talk about data visualization and information design. Um, we really welcome new voices. 30% uh, of all of our uh, postings are by first time publishers. And we pair you with an editor and we even pay you. Um, so uh, by all means, if you have an interest in publishing, getting started by adding your voice to the discourse, reach out to us at Nightingale. Um, I think it's a, a very uh, wonderful community based on a lot of shared joy. Um, so the next thing is that I first encountered uh, the data visualizations at W.E.B. Du Bois in a book about typography in 2018. At the time, there was really very little research about it, and I became obsessed with learning about it and to tell its story. Um, it was before uh, the uh, uh, Visualizing Black America book came out uh, recently. We'll talk about that at the end a little bit. And there were only one or two blog posts at the time, and I just couldn't believe it. Um, I think that my obsession with this whole thing started just the fact that how could something so amazing be so obscure? Um, and it's been a really remarkable journey uh, to learn about this work. Uh, and I'll be frank with you and say that I was completely unprepared for it. Um, so before I actually jump into the talk itself, I do want to kind of state a warning. Uh, I'll be using the word Negro frequently in this talk. It's not a word that I take lightly, but it's the term that Du Bois uses throughout this phase of his career. And it's best to honor and contextualize his use of language. So with that, let's get into it. The 1900 Paris Exposition was created to celebrate the achievements of the 19th century and sought to accelerate innovation in the next. It was designed around the Eiffel Tower, which you can see clearly here in the center of the image, built for the 1889 Exposition, but the 1900 Exposition was 10 times larger, extending all the way to the newly created Grand Palais, which you can see in the foreground. The fair was visited by nearly 50 million people and displayed many inventions for the first time, including the Ferris wheel, there it is as well, the picture. The diesel engine, probably harder to see in a picture like this. Uh, the escalator, and believe it or not, the first talking films. 56 countries uh, were participating in this uh, exposition and they all created pavilions representing their, their respective cultures. Um, but special exhibits like this one will actually be seen uh, here in the Palace of Social Economy. So it's important to see the 1900 exposition in the balance of history as a century of unprecedented innovation and widespread change was coming to an end. In 1833, the term science was invented. In 1863, Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation. In 1865, the US Civil War comes to an end. And as a result of the reconstruction period, former slaves are now granted unprecedented rights under the 14th Amendment. But racist lawmakers gained uh, power across the Southern states in the 1890s. And as Jim Crow laws began to radically roll back these rights under the guise of separate but equal segrega uh, segregation. This illustration from the 1893 Chicago Exposition adds further insult to injury by mocking the members of the human zoo known as the Dahomey Village. 
a few years later, another racist human zoo display is featured in the 1895 Atlanta Exposition. Outraged by the exhibits, lawyer Thomas J. Calloway sends a letter to hundreds of African-American leaders across the country that says, quote, to the Paris Exposition, thousands upon thousands will go. A well-selected and prepared exhibit representing the Negro's development will attract attention and do a great and lasting good in convincing thinking people of the possibilities of the Negro. Thomas Calloway was a classmate of Du Bois from Fisk University, and both men were in close contact with the most recognized African-American leader at the time, Booker T. Washington. A plan was crafted along with Daniel Murray, the Assistant Librarian of Congress, and the team was awarded $15,000 from the US Congress only four months before the opening of the exhibition. Du Bois was the obvious choice to lead the effort as chief curator, and he began to quickly compile the work on December 28, 1899, with his students from Atlanta University. What follows is a frenzy of activity. In just four months, prominent citizens, educators, and students across the country began to assemble the materials. The five great Negro schools of Atlanta, Fisk, Howard, Hampton, and Tuskegee universities prepare exhibits. Du Bois and his students conduct a sociological study in Georgia and begin to hand draw the 60 plus charts. Daniel Murray collects more than a thousand books and pamphlets by Negro authors. War heroes are documented, businesses, churches, and black newspapers from across the country send in photographs to their finest and best. 400 patents by African Americans are collected. As a subtle nod to systemic prejudice, Du Bois handwrites over 400 pages documenting the erosion of civil liberties known as the Black Codes. After working tirelessly on the exhibit for months, Du Bois writes in his diary that he was, quote, threatened with nervous prostration and had little money left to buy passage to Paris, but he arrived just in time. He quickly set up the exhibit in time for the judging, despite missing some of the materials from the universities, but the judges still recognize the exhibit by awarding it several prizes, including an overall Grand Prix and Du Bois a special gold medal. The resulting exhibition was a targeted attempt to sway the world's scientifically minded elite to acknowledge the American Negro in an attempt to influence cultural change in the United States from abroad. Pulitzer Prize winning biographer David Lavering Lewis writes, quote, in many ways, the Negro exhibit represented the last hurrah of men and women of culture and accomplishment who still aspired to full citizenship rights regardless of color. While the judges awarded the exhibit with several prizes, as you can see here, the direct impact of the exhibit of American Negroes is actually very hard to measure. While the African-American press reported on the exhibit with gleeful excitement, the European media only mentioned the exhibit in passing and the white American press completely ignored it. The American public never knew the exhibit of American Negroes even existed. Despite the work by Du Bois, Calloway, and an extended community to show the best of what African Americans had to offer, the exhibit was met with indifference. But let's take a step back and look at William Edward Burghardt Du Bois. He was the first African American to receive a doctorate from Harvard. Previously, Du Bois studied at Humboldt University in Berlin and traveled in Europe before ultimately landing his first academic job at the University of Philadelphia. Desperate to help the plight of the African-American population, he quickly turned to the recently developing field of social science in an attempt to collect compelling evidence needed for cultural change. Du Bois was rigorous in his approach and tried to incorporate the latest scientific standards. He said, quote, the American Negro deserves study for the great end of advancing the cause of science in general. No such opportunity to watch and measure the history and development of a great race of men ever presented itself to the scholars of a modern nation. Arriving in Philadelphia after graduating from Harvard, uh, he created his first watership study, The Philadelphia Negro in 1899. Compiled nearly by himself, Du Bois personally conducted some 5,000 interviews to complete the study. Here is a spread from the book, which shows some of his data visualizations clearly focusing on the scientific presentation of the statistical data. Du Bois was very ambitious. That same year, he outlined a 10-year study of the American Negro seen as a continuation of, of the Philadelphia Negro research, and he conducted a very similar study in Virginia. Du Bois actually moved to Atlanta before the Philadelphia Negro is published, 
So when Calloway suggests Du Bois become the curator of the exhibit for the 1900 exposition, Du Bois naturally proposes a study of the Georgia Negro. And like I said, Du Bois was very ambitious. At the time he wrote, quote, I wanted to set down my aim and method in some outstanding way which would bring my work to the thinking world. The great World's Fair at Paris was being planned and I thought my, I might find, I might put my findings into plans, charts and figures so that one might see what we're trying to accomplish. Du Bois recalls the creation of the exhibit in his autobiography written at the age of 90. Quote, I got a couple of my best students and put a series of facts into charts, the size and growth of the Negro American group, its division by age and sex, its distribution, education and occupations, its books and periodicals. We made a most interesting set of drawings limbed on pasteboard cards about a yard square and mounted on a number of movable standards. The details of finishing these 50 or more charts in colors with accuracy was terribly difficult with little money, limited time, and not much encouragement. The resulting exhibit was more than just a scientific report. Du Bois set out to make a targeted attempt to sway the world's elite by upending the stereotypes and presenting a modern, successful, and educated people. He set out to do this by crafting a structured statistical argument of the quantitative facts. On the first chart in the series, he leads with the statement, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. It's a phrase he uses again in the book that brought him global fame in 1903, The Souls of Black Folk. Ah. One of the most powerful examples of data visualization was made 121 years ago by an all African American team led by W.E.B. Du Bois only 37 years after the end of slavery in the United States. The data visualizations of the exhibit are split into two sections. The Georgia Negro, which focuses on the quote, typical state of Georgia, which had the second largest African-American population. Virginia at the time actually had the largest. And Georgia also had the highest Negro to white ratio. The other section is called quote, a series of statistical charts illustrating the condition of the descendants of former African slaves now in residence in the United States of America which focuses on the national and international view of the data. The exact sequence of, of how Du Bois made the chart is not, the charts is not entirely known, but the Library of Congress has a Georgia Negro as the first of the two. This is a sequence as defined potentially even by Daniel J. Murray himself when he entered them into the Library of Congress a few years after the exhibition. But you'll see, we're gonna come back to this a little bit later. So let's start to dig into the work by looking at an international view of the data in quote, Negro population of the United States compared with the total population of other countries. This map diagram shows us the comparison between a smaller 7.5 million populated all Negro America to 10 other countries, all drawn in proportion to their populations. Du Bois makes the comparison in terms of nationhood, clearly inferring the existence of an independent black state that exists as an equivalent to the established European countries like Spain, England, and Hungary. You'll notice that the chart itself is in English and French, French so that the widest group of exposition guests can read the labels. Pivoting then from the international to the national, in the next chart in the series, Du Bois visualizes Negro population growth as a small nation growing inside of the American silhouette. Du Bois elegantly crafts a complex argument. As the silhouette of the country grows, the Negro population also grows, not at a faster rate, but as a distinctly different entity. This is not a line or a bar chart to compare numbers. Du Bois again visualizes the data in terms of distinct nations. When viewed alongside the preceding image showing a fully Negro populated United States in comparison to the European countries, Du Bois clearly implies the possibility of a separate Negro nation state. This chart, illiteracy of the American Negro compared with that of other nations is from the second series. And as you'll notice, the printed title at the top of the chart. If there was a breakout idea that challenged the status quo, it's this finding by Du Bois. One can almost hear the surprise when Du Bois writes, quote, Negro illiteracy is less than that of Russia and only equal to that of Hungary. 
while Negroes were synonymous with being uneducated, Du Bois showed that several European countries had a higher illiteracy rate. He is literally saying to the audience at the Paris Exposition, are we really so different than you are? The finality of the one word title illiteracy speaks volumes in this chart. The period at the end of the title helps to underscore the severity of the statement. From the Georgia Negro series, the chart is an unusual plotting of time versus rate with time on the vertical and bars extending from each axis to form a sort of lattice. Du Bois is only telling part of the larger story in this chart as the white illiteracy rate in 1900 was only 6.2%. But Du Bois was not highlighting the racial disparity in the series. Instead, he was focusing on the decrease in illiteracy and overall progress in the African-American community. Here's an example of an updated ver version by Dadavis superstar and Guardian contributor Mona Chalabi where she updated the chart with the latest available data. Uh, I show it as a quick example of how the visualizations of the past can inspire the forms of data storytelling in the present. Income and expenditure of 150 Negro families in Atlanta, Georgia, USA is probably the most unique chart in the series. It's, a, it's singular in its horizontal format and features a unique design within the exhibit. The chart acts as a sort of key to the entire series as it humanizes the data. The top row of the chart is like an expanded legend with rent, food, clothes, taxes, and other expenses also doubling as column headers that are mapped to the colors we see in the horizontally stacked bar chart below. This chart actually comes at the end of the Georgia Negro series. It's number 31, but actually was displayed as the introduction to the charts in the exhibit, as you can see here in the original photograph. On the inset image, you can actually see the coin and photos of the chart. Du Bois used the mixed media on the chart to connect the data with the rest of the exhibit, which relied heavily on images of prosperous, successful African Americans that challenged conventions. As my research intensified, so did my questions, and I found myself in contact with the Library of Congress Prints and Photographs Division. Let me just make an interruption here by saying, when I say I found myself in contact, it was more like I went to beg the Library of Congress Prints and <laughs> Photographs Division. And after six weeks of begging with those librarians, I was permitted, quote, very special permission to view only one of the Du Bois charts in person. It was a real thrill to see the handmade work and examine the actual pen marks I've been studying for months already. As you can see, uh, uh, as you can see, the, the charts are quite large at 27 by 22 inches. That's my computer there for scale, the same one that I'm speaking from today. Uh, uh, this is also the only work in the series to feature gold leaf and colored crayon as well as collage photographs. It's also an important chart, as I'll argue that Du Bois is actually among the very first designers to consider their visualizations to be interactive, as evident in the label, quote, for further statistics, raise this frame. This photo that I took of the original uh, shows how the chart was physically handled, and these marks suggest the indentation of the fingernails of the Paris Exposition guests. Exploring details like these could only be possible by viewing the original works and certainly help to understand the context and creation of the work. Since the charts were made to be handled, they were sequenced to expose new layers of data in each subsequent chart. It's likely that a jump from one chart uh, to another was synonymous in Du Bois time, uh, in du Bois time to a double click in ours. So out of the 60 charts in the exhibit, I personally find this one to be one of the most compelling. The proportion of freedmen and slaves among American Negroes. The label slaves arranged inside of the mountainous black area is still a kick in the gut. The green ribbon at the top of the chart shows the ratio of free to enslaved African Americans over roughly a century. There are many different ways Du Bois could have charted this data. By putting the focus on the freemen, both in the colored ribbon, as well as by listing out the percentages of each decade, it emphasizes their minority in comparison to the massive black area below. The story it tells is simple. For 76 years, no less than 86% of all African Americans in the United States were slaves. But the nuanced story remains on the right side of the chart. The Emancipation Proclamation was signed on January 1st, 1863, yet it takes an additional seven years and an entire civil war 
for the remaining 6,675,000 slaves to gain their freedom. Here's a chart from the Georgia Negro series. And as you can see, it's made in much the same way as the chart that preceded it. This time we see the percentages, uh, the percent of free Negroes over the same 73 year period as a red area cascading down the right side of the chart, wavering between 0.7 and 1.7% until it at last reaches 100% at the bottom. But looking at the 1860 census to get some sense of scale, of the total population of 1,057,000 people in Georgia, 462,000 were slaves. That's 44% of the entire population. And as I said a second ago, the chart on the right is a sort of rotated view of the chart on the left. Du Bois is careful to keep similar types of data and their comparative modes while exploring each data set to highlight the story on each level of granularity. This chart, Occupations of Negroes and Whites in Georgia, is also from the Georgia Negro series. It presents a dazzling near symmetrical chart of Du Bois' own design, where two mirrored fan charts display corresponding categories, allowing, allowing the direct comparison across a sort of event horizon that effectively delineates the color line. The legend applies equally to both groups and the distribution of the occupations between the two groups is surprisingly similar. similar. Negro farmers are only 2% lower than white farmers. Negroes have a considerably higher percentage of service occupations while whites have considerably more industrial and mechanical jobs. But they are displayed here as comparable units within a circular whole. I find this type of chart to be quite effective while non-traditional even today, it is intuitive and using the right data could easily be repurposed. But this chart, but with this chart, I also want to address what I think is a misconception. A number of articles have called out the striking design and limited primary colors of the charts to presage modernism. While the concept is certainly extremely appealing, I believe that it is incorrect. As I mentioned earlier, Du Bois considered himself to be an academic, and as he was deeply versed in the most contemporary methods of depicting data. Du Bois had studied many sociological texts, including the work of Henry Gannett, which he, refer, which he referenced in the Philadelphia Negro the year before. So it is obvious that Du Bois was familiar with Gannett's statistical atlas of the United States, which featured luxuriously illustrated maps and charts, as well as sociological data that he incorporated into his work. Considering Du Bois and team were under such strict time constraints, luxuries like printing were clearly out of the question. The resulting handmade works gained an artistic dimension that is missing from the more scientific work at the time. Each chart would need to be hand painted watercolor on thick cardstock, and it's likely that Du Bois even chose to use watercolors by George C. Osborne manufactured in Philadelphia. It, he likely chose basic primary colors for their ability to easily imprint on his scientifically minded European audience. He stripped away any decoration in order to make the charts more effective, and the precision of the charts conveyed scientific authenticity. While the works are remarkably beautiful, they were likely crafted for influence, not artistic merit. So if you'll excuse me for a moment longer, let's take a little detour into art history. While precursors of, to modernism were present, in the, were present in the 19th century, the concept of modernism wasn't established until the other isms, like surrealism, had crystallized around Europe in the first years of the 20th century. This took time, and most of the modernists were simply too young to have been directly inspired by the works at the exposition and in 1900. Picasso was 19 years old and traveled from Spain, where he was living, to Paris for only a few months in the fall of that year. Walter Gropius, who started the Bauhaus, was only 17. Laszlo Moholy Nagy was only five years old. Piet Mondrian was 28, but was living in the Netherlands. And Kandinsky was also 28, but had just traded a career in law in Russia to attend art school in Munich. The fusion of science with art that fueled modernism in general, and in specific, the Bauhaus in Vienna circle, was certainly a similar space that Du Bois was operating in two decades earlier but as a sociologist. One can only imagine what might have happened if he and his team had found the right support at the Paris Exposition. Had the impact of the exhibit of American Negroes been an international touchstone, Du Bois might have continued to craft statistical charts and the line between this work 
and what was to come in art and design might have been possible. Okay, back to statistics. This chart, acres of land owned by Negroes in Georgia, also comes from the Georgia Negro series. Not only do we see the 214% increase in acres of land owned, but Du Bois also presents us the data in the shape of the state of Georgia itself. Du Bois creates a visual analogy suggesting that Negroes are Georgia, which is a very optimistic statement despite the rise of Jim Crow laws designed to strip African-Americans of their legal rights. Yet the chart shows steady socioeconomic progress in spite of the prejudice. This is the most recognized chart by Du Bois, City and Rural Population, 1890. It exemplifies the creativity that Du Bois em employed in creating this work, and in some ways cements his place in history as a data viz innovator. It's an unusual chart that we now call a Du Bois spiral, and while it is obscure, that actually does a good job at showing massively disproportionate comparisons. The chart tells a story of just how many African Americans lived in rural Georgia than in the smaller or larger cities. The large red spiral immediately leaves an impression, a visual beacon that draws the eye in a way that few charts could. The innovation that Du Bois made was built on precedent, as it, as it was common at the time to simply bend a very long bar chart into a sort of snake if it didn't fit into the allotted area. And as we can see on other charts from the same series in the right, that he used it there too. Another way of looking at the Du Bois spiral is to envision it as a horizontally stacked bar chart on an extremely long scale. Breaking the stacked bar into a series of angles highlights the disparity in the data and the resulting massive red spiral is a great way to focus on the main insight. Of course, as my illustration shows in the bottom right, it could have also been an ordinary bar chart. But if it were, I doubt I'd be speaking about it today, 121 years later. This brings up an important area that's easy to gloss over. But remember that Du Bois was trying to impress his audience. He was trying to show off. And while many of the charts are traditional in their design, he knew that these kind of unusual forms would create more interest. Not all charts are created equal and 22 charts in the exhibit are fairly conventional bar charts. Our visual literacy allows us to quickly read traditional chart types, but at the same time, it also makes them easier to forget. The role of novelty in our chart making should not be devalued, nor even dismissed as chart junk, but rather used to focus our audience's attention on what matters. Clearly, this form resonated with audiences and has proven to be historically important as a result of its novelty. Like I said earlier, I'm very interested in the sequence of the charts uh, for the exhibition. I felt that learning more about the sequence could help us to understand how they were made and how they were meant to be viewed. As my research intensified, I compiled a list of the charts in sequential order as provided by the Library of Congress, then returned to the exhibit photo itself to look for more clues. What I found was shocking. I love that, such a teaser, such a cliffhanger, isn't it? <laughs> On the upper right side of the image is a chart that I could not identify in the collection of the Library of Congress. I triple checked the inventory and there was one chart that was similar, but it was not the same design. I quickly started to play around with the image in Photoshop and found the highest resolution image I could, but I could rarely see it that it, I could already see that it was a unique new piece that had not been studied before. So like anyone working on a research project, I then went back and pleaded with more librarians for help. Librarians, if you're on here, we love you. <laughs> Luckily, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst Library had the original image and sent over a high resolution version and the decrease of illiteracy among the black freedmen of the United States. This previously unknown work was hidden in plain sight. The quality of the image is now high enough to decipher the text. The chart, the chart shows the 36 percent, uh, percent drop in illiteracy of freedmen over a 30 year period. As you can see, I was also able to recolor the work based on the corresponding grayscales in the image. There are only a few options available from the limited palette to choose from. And I also believe that this green and black color have a clear correlation with some of the charts we've seen earlier in the lecture. 
And I believe this newly discovered chart is actually a missing link between the three views of data for both illiteracy and the proportion of freedmen. This work creates a clear correlation between freedom and education and shows just how systematic Du Bois was in crafting his message and reinforcing it throughout the entire series. There are 63 of Du Bois's charts from the exhibit of American Negroes in the collection of the Library of Congress. By identifying a 64th chart, it opens up some additional ambiguity. As mentioned, some of the works on the second series um, have printed titles, which mean they could actually be printed first as it would have taken longer to get the titles uh, printed. But the charts in the second series with green outlines are actually hand lettered. So it could be that they were actually created at the end of the project. And if you think about it, it makes sense. As the research and data collection for the Georgia Negro series was being conducted, some of Du Bois students were already drafting the initial charts. It's very likely that the team uncovered, uncovered additional insights as they worked. And since Du Bois was committed to a structured argument, they would naturally find additional visual methods for telling a compelling story. It's important to consider just how surprising, how surprising this ex ex exhibition would have been as African-Americans were held in low esteem across the white world in 1900. While certainly free of the hostilities of white Americans, this exhibition was intended to curry favor with Europeans, many of which harbored significant prejudice. Du Bois and team took great care in considering how their exhibit would be perceived. So it also makes sense that a strong visual would take a very important place in the exhibit itself above the crowds and in the line of sight from outside the exhibit. Certainly the story on the great improvement in the literacy would have been more palatable than the story of slavery itself. Because the exhibit was not a success at the time, Du Bois took an abrupt turn away from the social sciences. And in 1903, he published the work that would bring his ideas to a global audience. The Souls of Black Folks is a remarkable book that pairs elements of his ethnographic research with African-American poetry and spiritual songs. In the book, his anger boils through, his rage is paired with his brilliance and his passionate voice quickly became recognized as a leader in the struggle for African-American lives rights. So it's interesting to think about this quote written in his biography at the age of 90 <clears throat> on his early years in social science. Where had I failed? There were many answers, but one was typically American as the event proved. I did the deed, but I did not advertise it. In the long run, advertising without the deed was the only lasting value. Perhaps Americans do not realize how completely they have adopted this philosophy but Madison Avenue does. The story of the exhibit of American Negroes is so compelling because it is the story of a missed opportunity. It is ultimately a brilliant tragedy for the small nature, nation of people that Du Bois and his expanded team tried so hard to present to an indifferent white audience. As viewers of this work in the present, we're all too aware of the inequalities that followed after the exhibit. We can point to the superior design and brilliant minds with the knowledge that their cause was not recognized until the Civil Rights Act outlawed discrimination based on race, color, gender, or national origin 64 years later. Knowing that a pivotal moment like this existed with such incredible opportunity for change all the way back in 1900 gives additional perspective to the Black Lives Matter movement today, 121 years later. While I'm thrilled to be discussing to this day, uh, discussing this today, the fact is that this work is still underexplored and is yet to really be embraced by mainstream academics. Du Bois' abrupt turn away from the social sciences certainly necessitates the study of his career and impact on his life. Yet at the same time, his role in the social sciences remains less known. The charts in the exhibit were only digitized in 2013 and any previous study was done only on the black and white microfilm available that you can see in the lower left corner. There are a few rich sources of information, many by Du Bois himself, such as this full recounting of the exhibit in the Review of Reviews, as well as the recently published book on the subject. But the fact remains that more research is waiting to be done, not only on the context of the exhibit, but on the historic data itself as compiled by Du Bois and his team. 
This is a rich source of information just waiting to be explored. With every book, article, social media post, and even lecture like today, the story of the exhibit of American Negroes continues to spread Du Bois' daring vision. I've gotten involved in researching and writing about these works. Uh, as I got involved, I found that there are more voices from the past that have just not been explored. I continually find amazing st stories about innovative but overlooked data viz practitioners from the past and more surface every day. Over and over again, I find graphic forms from the past can inspire us to create new ways of communicating or visualizing ideas today. This research has changed me as a person and as a practitioner. So I end my talk today by asking you what other stories are out there to be found and retold. Thank you very much. Is it okay to clap? I'll clap on behalf of everyone else. <laughs> that was incredible. I mean, I think, you know, the passion of the boys you feel, and you also get a sense of his intention. I love what you said about, you know, really trying to change the impression that people have within the U.S. and outside the U.S. about African Americans at that time. And I found a lot of um, current um, relationship between what he did and, and how we could use data visualization today. So my first question for you in terms of the follow-up one, thank you so much for a beautiful presentation. That was really good. And we could also sense, Jason, your passion for his work. Like clearly you are, you know, a, a, a poster child for um, the boys' work and you've done a really good job, you know, really capturing all the important aspects and the story that he's really trying to convey. So from your extensive findings, um, how as, or in your opinion, um, was he recognized, was he revered um, for his work? Because I know you talked about, you know, some of, the, some of the recognitions that he got, but for the data visualization aspect of it, do you, in your opinion, was he revered and recognized for his contributions? No, I, I think it's one of those things that it wasn't necessarily overlooked, just um, deeply, deeply obscure, right? Uh, it, it, this work played a fairly short, it played a very small role in his overall career, which had an unbelievable impact. And certainly others will be able to speak more on his uh, legacy a, a, a across his career. I do believe that a lot of his subsequent work that became very popular uh, very important was partially defined by this experience. And that's why I kind of doubled down on that, on that quote at the end about uh, the impact of, uh, of advertising the deeds, uh, the Madison Ad Ad Avenue quote, because it, you can see he, that he, and again, this, what I say this kind of, or actually as David Lovering Lewis says, a small nation of people, they're, they're so optimistic. They're gonna go to the big fair and they're gonna help create the moment of change. And when it doesn't happen, like anyone, they start to wonder why. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing I'd say is that this also speaks very much for um, the, the obscurity of this work, uh, speaks for the need for people to uh, research our archives and to dig into, just start to ask questions because the moment you start to look for these practitioners of any race, gender, ethnicity, or creed, you'll find 10 more, right? And so it's just a slippery slope of kind of getting a word and Googling that one and going to the library and they, oh, we'll actually look at this book. And that is where we are to a degree uh, uh, across our culture, zooming back more and more to get more of these practitioners. So hopefully that was an easy answer for you. Yeah, no, that was good. I think that's what it is, is like, you know, data scientists like myself and people who use data viz, um, telling the story and telling the story in a way that it's, it conveys a message and also forces some kind of drive for change or some insightfulness or some actions afterwards is really the point of all of the work, right? It's not necessarily as you should show how great you are telling stories, but it's like telling the story to really move a needle um, and he's done a good job with depicting and really challenging what the status quo was currently at that time. So and my other- Can I add no, a reaction to that real quick? Um, oh. Because the other thing that's so fascinating about this exhibit in particular is that it's so multimedia. It mm -hmm. took so many people to combine all of this stuff together. There are sculptures, 
Uh, <laughs> there are all of these books. There, of course, the data visualizations, and it's all blended in a way of basically data storytelling uh, and storytelling, like we see today in journalism. But the fact that they did it in 1900 is the part that just blows our mind. And it's not like we see this happening over and over again, really until the mid-century or, or later. Absolutely. And I think it, it comes to the, my next question is given how much data and information and the investment in technology today, you know, how do you think the boys would have used this? Like, would he change anything in his approach, you think? Well, I think one of, one of the realities is that it wasn't enough, right? Mm -hmm. And he was super ambitious. Like he's really clear about his ambition. If you look into him, he's, he's a challenging character and he really, really wanted to grab people's attention. And I think that he realized it was really in the pairing of his brilliance and his passion. It wasn't going to be a, uh, a clinical scientific study. So I absolutely think that if he were alive today and we're still working in the space, he would try to uh, emphasize the humanistic aspects, show people's faces, probably even rub our noses in it even worse than a lot of the people do around us today. Um, and that's how you create change. You force people to, uh, to see the world as it really is. And I really like what you said too, that you, know, you often wanted to impress his audience, right? Um, and that shows because, you know, there's no way that you wouldn't want to just gather some more. Like we could have you keep going for another hour or two. Um, so talking about data as a catalyst of change, right? Social change, racial justice, and you guys don't know what's going on in the world today and, and how much um, influence the BML movement and other movements have come to bear. Um, what are some good examples that you could share with us on the use of data visualization to really merge data as the catalyst for change? Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ways to take this one. So the first thing that I find fascinating is that the COVID-19 pandemic has actually brought data visualization to the forefront because it's data heavy and very complex, very nuanced. And we have started to leverage data visualization to see what you know, uh, 150 million or 450 million uh, people who have died as a result of the pandemic looks like. We have used data visualization to see exactly how the pandemic has evolved. And that has taken place in the front pages of a lot of our newspapers. Um, we constantly are getting new ways of exploring the data visually. So uh, visualizing the abstractness of data has taken uh, a, a lot of importance. Uh, certainly the New York Times, uh, which is a leader in information design, information graphics, has time and again showed us different ways of incorporating, uh, you know, videos from social media uh, pulled together into this, this mesh of timelines to see exactly what happened and certain uh, protests are, of course, uh, uh, unbelievable, uh, 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 outrageous uh, actions from uh, uh, policing across the U.S. And, and there's ways to do this that we can look to the past to try to draw that inspiration from. Um, the last thing I'll say is that there are also more groups focusing on this. There's a group called Black and Data of data scientists uh, of African American or uh, African Americans or African descent, uh, a global network of people that are Black in data, and they're collecting their own data sets. They're starting to report them out to people, and I think we need to we need to look at that. And the last thing I have, sorry, long-winded answer is there's a fantastic book that I would really highly, highly, highly recommend called Data Feminism. It takes an intersectional look at feminism. So uh, what that means is how the data is collected, who is collecting it and what they're using it for. And again, it helps us to look at our data collection, our data science and back out a lens, right? Mm -hmm. Are all reports, like for example, there's been a lot of studies about how uh, 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 machine learning uh, doesn't uh, pick up uh, black skin like it does for other races. And that's just one of many, many examples of how the people that are doing the analysis uh, really matter and co connecting with the community to have that conversation matters. That's where the change is. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to kind of talk a little bit more about the example you gave um, earlier about your work, um, if, if you guys follow him on, on um, LinkedIn, you'll find this work too. 
you did an interactive um, data, I guess, collection, looking at the correlation between unemployment rate and the spread of COVID-19. That was so brilliant. And, you know, now talking about, you know, data as a catalyst for change and the examples that you use, if we were to analyze social movement, right, and we were to kind of create some kind of data visualization picture, so to speak, what particular, um, how would you do that with any of these movements that exist today? You know, how would you create an interactive type of data collection or representation of how to create these social movements and measure the impact that they're having in society? Mm -hmm. So um, a, few a few responses. The first is that I've been deeply influenced and inspired by a practitioner named Georgia Lupi. In 2013, she had a manifesto called Data Humanism, which effectively suggests that any aspect of data ultimately is a recording of some kind of something connected to humanity, account of humanity, some kind of action, some kind of movement, something about people is related ultimately to the data. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of that, we should really try to find new ways of showing that humanity in the data. I think that's one of the things that the Data Feminism book talks about is that you know that the data by itself is almost worthless. The tables by themselves are almost worthless. You can, uh, any data scientist can tell you, I, they can churn out millions of static bar charts or interactive bar charts or scientists, deeply complex 3D renderings of big data sets. But the reality is that without that missing human element, we'll never really connect with it in the same way. So uh, thank you for calling out this piece. We have a, a, a project that, that recently uh, launched on the, uh, the COVID Response Center that was really looking at the intersection of vulnerable populations in the US and US unemployment. And one of the things that we did is that we were given a very large data set. And I think some of my colleagues are even on the call today. So uh, what we did is we started at the beginning, the first meeting, and we said, how can we humanize this? How can we find real people that we can put their faces up there and say, let's learn about your story. And that's what we did is we went out and we collected uh, several uh, personal examples of people that, are, that have left the workforce or are under deeply troubling circumstances. And then after we allow them a chance to talk through their story, we help contextualize it. And then last point is that we also try to create some novel data visualizations. It's not just a bunch of boring bar charts. But we try to find a way for people to see themselves in the data, to see the people behind the data. And it's, and it's hard, it's not easy, but, but the goal is it, it makes a difference when you, when you go through that process to try to make that connection with people. Yeah, no, that was established well, because at least you can even, it was geo-targeted too, so you can look at your, your location, what impact, what imprint it's having as well. So one other question before I take some questions from the panelists. Um, is, you know, what do you, where do you go personally to update your knowledge and skills in the data visualization space? Nightingale, uh, <laughs> look at that. I dropped the reference to my own publication again. Uh, hey, there's a Madison Avenue part. Um, I am obsessed with books. I, uh, I would happily show <laughs> that I have books all around me. I have bookshelves to the left and the right of me. I, literally have books uh, that are supporting this thing that holds holding my laptop. Um, I'm addicted to finding books and to learning about other people's um, approaches. And that's where I feel like having this uh, interest like Michael does in, in history just makes it so easy because there's so many incredible ideas out there. And the moment we try to lift or take inspiration, it changes and it becomes something that is somehow a part of our practice. And so it's the easiest way to be inspired is just to go out and to learn a little bit about what other people have done in the past. Yeah. And I just want to add that I really like the example you gave about the relationship between humanizing the data and actually having a more convincing data presentation as a result of that. And I would say that marketers uh, make the best data scientists. So, you know, we have a degree on market analytics. And I love how we blended marketing and analytics and that because my students are able to use their knowledge of consumer behavior and really work with the data to, to bring out opportunities that's best for the competing as well as the people that work there. All right, Jason, I'm going to pivot to our lovely panelists because I know they have some questions for you as well. Uh, Michael, I'll let you lead. Um, 
And so I will kind of pivot over to Michael to call whoever has the first question to go ahead and ask Jason about his work. Yeah, I'll uh, yield my time to John Kane, uh, great senator from the Center for Global Affairs. So John, you'll have to come off mute, but uh, Jason, Lillian, thank you for an extraordinary discussion, uh, already very provocative and uh, you know, picking up comments in the Q&A and from, and from the uh, participants, uh, you know, you've definitely engaged people and got them thinking and, uh, you know, rushing out to buy books, check out your website and everything. So, John, you had a, you had a question, you'll have to come off mute and then the uh, question is yours. I did, yeah. First of all, thank you so much, Jason. That was, that was truly excellent. Um, I did a quick comment and then, and then one question uh, I was curious about. And so just on, on the comments, um, as someone sort of trained in social science uh, and, and making graphs for you know journal articles and stuff, some, something that gets kind of beaten into a lot of us is just you know have your graphs as uh, straightforward and kind of standalone as possible, minimize any distraction, make sure that the the kind of you know data come through almost an emphasis on 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 the numbers and quantities. And sort of minimize the the artistry of it and and distraction of it, um, and and I I think I generally agree with that. Um, but I love the example you gave of that that spiral chart as being just this is strange. And you know if if this were in a social science journal, I could just imagine journal reviewers being like, "What is this? Stop it!" You know, there's a much easier way to present this. Um, but I love that it, it's the point you made and a point that I never thought about is that it's, it, you kind of want this to be strange and, and memorable um, and yet n not lose the, the sort of uh, you know, numeric comparison that the author's trying to make um, visually, which, which is just great. It, it's kind of like, you know, maybe I'll adopt a mantra of extraordinary statistics require extraordinary graph you know this is something you, you really want um you know if it's something really powerful that you're trying to communicate quantitatively maybe it does require uh, a really unusual way of displaying it uh, even if it's not the most straightforward you know bar charts that we've all seen uh so that's the comment and then on the question um i was just really curious uh, you know, you, you open the discussion and close the discussion with sort of Du Bois reflecting on on the failure of of this event. And you know, as as someone who sort of uh, studies causal inference and and measurement and good old stuff like that, just curious if you came across any insights or, or maybe other writings of his. How did he determine that it was a failure? Like, what made him think that it was a failure? Uh, you know. If it were a failure, how how could we know that? Um, and and part of the reason I asked was because you showed that that awesome picture of, you know, the the indentations from people's fingers and fingernails that people were actually you know lifting up these these charts to to look at more statistics. As someone who teaches this stuff, I mean that's a success right there. It, they wanted more information. Uh, at least some of these exhibition goers, uh, than you know what was in those charts. So in, in some ways that's a success. But I'm just curious if you had any bigger insights about you know how, how did he determine that this was a failure and sort of by what comparison, by what measure? Uh, any thoughts you might have on that? Thanks so much. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty easy answer, which is that it didn't create any change. He st was still subjected to horrible um, acts of of prejudice and racism. Um, for his whole career. Um, nothing changed for 64 years until the civil rights movement. So, you know, they didn't do this because they wanted to go to Paris and have fun. They did it because their backs were up against the wall. Um, so I think that it, it didn't create the influence. And the other thing, even for him personally, it didn't, he was not, his fame did not grow. His ideas were not shared. Right, it's not like people pick these up and move with them. Um, I think you know that's one of the reasons. There's a, two other things I want to comment on this. Um, the one is that I, I do double down, and I recognize this. Um, this is a choice that I've made. I've re I've tried to double down by saying that this exhibit was not successful, 
mainly because I, I do think it's important that people see it in the context of history, that this was a learning opportunity to actually pivot away from or how to do something a little differently that did create real change. Um, because I think that they, we do run the risk of celebrating something that might be oversized, maybe potentially become oversized in his career, which is deeply important and interesting. So it's, I, I, I do that really for context, it's important. I will say that I have met several Du Bois uh, scholars and experts uh, of which I do not consider myself one. And they always come to me and say, we have studied his work for our whole lives, including even an actual living Du Bois mentee. Um, and they, none of them ever know about this. So like, it wasn't something that they talk about. It's not, it has not been a part of the conversation in data viz or in uh, Du Bois history, or even to a degree in African-American history. So I do think it's important to, to, to show its brilliance, to share its brilliance, but it's important to contextualize it for what it is. And hopefully, by contextualizing it in this way, that inspires us to actually do something more. My last point, John, um, I'm sorry, this is a long-winded answer. Um, my last point is I absolutely create lots and lots of charts that are designed to be able to be read instantly. I think it's a classic example is you don't want to be able to figure out some data art on the dashboard of an airplane when you're landing. You want to know the number exactly, right? Um, the difference is that we can leverage all the different aspects of visual communication and data this. And there are some times when you want people to basically decode what that is, almost like a game. And by doing that, it invests us in what the story is. That's one of the reasons why people are doing lots of physical data visualization. They actually have to draw a line on the wall or something like this. Because when you draw your line to, to show your data, your mark, it's a lot different than just looking at the bar chart as you quickly turn page to page. So different use cases, different audiences, but all valid in my opinion. Jason, I'm going to uh, jump to a couple of quick questions from the panelists. It's about 1.15, a little shy of that. And then we'll try and work through. There's four or five really healthy questions from the. Uh, so uh, Dr. Savage, Tim, if you can ask a question and Jason answer it uh, relatively succinctly, and then I'll go to Chris, Gaffney, and and then back to uh, Lillian. So I'll be good. So really, first of all, absolutely fantastic presentation. Two, two simple questions. Do we know the sort of physical tools he used to generate these amazing visualizations? And do we have the underlying data? We didn't have Excel then, but do we have the underlying data? Uh, so two quick things. It's all pen and ink and watercolor. Um, I did a lot of research to try to find that watercolor based on like where I think he would have been, also what was available at the time. And for for some reason, watercolor in antiquity is highly researched, right? So like that's one of the things we were able to kind of plug in. The other thing that was really highly researched, or there's a, pretty easy to find. There's a number of ways of uh, like industrial draftsmen or like even technical arts. How do you make an engraving? How do you draw uh, like a technical document? And so uh, there's a lot uh, in some of the Medium articles that I publish, I, I go into a lot of details about the actual um, templates they use to draw the text and how that's kind of designed and even some uh, different ways of drafting those lines that are so beautifully straight. Um, did that, that answer your question? Yeah, but just the other, do we have the sources of his underlying data? Oh. Yeah, so what's interesting, I've been asked this question a few times and I love it. What's interesting is that Du Bois was an innovator in data collection as well. Not only did he go out and conduct the interviews, I presume there are forms someplace, maybe locked away in an archive someplace of the actual data collection effort. But all, most of the data that you see there is unique to him and his team although he does ref refer to other statistical sources uh, that he pulled out of statistical atlases, for example, in the Gannett atlas that I showed. And Gannett also has a lot of uh, demographic data that uh, explores race, especially as you know, African-Americans had such few rights, but represented such a large percentage of American society. So, so Chris, uh... Any any thoughts or questions for you? And then uh, we'll turn to some really great questions from the, the participants. Yep. Uh, hi, Jason. Thanks for, for your presentation and for your work on this. It's really fascinating. Uh, I have a, qu a 
question about the, the data literacy aspect of this, because obviously Dubois was very, Dubois was very literate in the data and he was teaching people about this. And so theoretically there was a school of thought that what one would expect to emerge mm -hmm. and that would have continued after his retirement. And it seems that we, that we may have lost that in the, um, in the 40s and 50s and then the 60s comes storming back with more data but and then now again we're facing a, an emergence of an overwhelming amount of data and and trying to teach our students how to be data literate within that and so i'm wondering if there is a, a some pedagogy that he's left behind that we can bring forward uh into the current moment to see how he was teaching his students what he was teaching his students and what the product of his intellectual, um, uh, his geneal intellectual genealogy ended yeah. up being. So the first thing is that uh, all the works or almost all the works actually explicitly say done by students of Atlanta University, right? So I know from a class ledger in 1901 that there are 10 women and one man. Uh, the one man is kind of insinuated to maybe being the, the author of the charts themselves, the actual drafts person of the charts. Um, I can't find the, the, the verification of that data, although some other scholars have pointed to it a few times. Uh, more than happy to learn more about that from other researchers. Um, we do know the names of these women. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, William Andrew Rogers is the guy that allegedly was the drafts person. And I, do, I could not find anything of their stories. That doesn't mean it's not out there. So again, another opportunity of research. Um, so, uh, data visualization basically came into its own in the 19th century. It was a huge movement, almost being, almost kind of mimicking or uh, attached to the age of innovation itself. And so there was actually a tremendous amount of data viz literacy, um, even as actual, you know, reading literacy was also evolving. Now, because uh, uh, visual communication is different from actually reading the inf information, I think also about the work of Otto and Mary Neurath, who started to use employ pictorial statistics, uh, pictographs, and kind of various ways of illustrating data, and uh, really starting around the, in 1927 as a way to get over some of those barriers with an audience. My last point is, here's the bombshell. I think our visual literacy actually suffered in the 70s and 80s. There's plenty of charts. Uh, there's plenty of amazing uh, data visualization types going all the way through uh, Fortune magazine in the 20s and 30s and 40s. And I think the thing that has really brought us to our knees is the computer. Can you imagine that? We have leveraged all these technological ways of drawing computationally because it's hard to make a map. It's hard to plot all those points out. But in the act of doing that, because our technology was growing and was nascent, we, we stripped away a lot of that creativity. We stripped away a lot of, the, of the, the work that was happening adjacent to it, where they were illustrating things in multiple colors or printing things on these wonderful offset presses. Um, and only I feel like kind of now-ish or like in the 2010s, we started to get back to that deeply creative blend of data viz and, uh, and visual communication. So uh, controversial statement, Edward Tufte fans out there will probably come after me with a pitchfork, but you know, I can back that up. <laughs> Thank you, Jason, that was really good. And great question from our panelists. Uh, yeah. Clearly you have our wheels turning. Uh, we're also looking at, I like that we're also thinking about how do we apply these these uh, pedagogy to how we teach our students in today's times. So we have some additional questions for you, Jason. Um, one in particular, which I really like from the audience. Someone asked, um, how did the audience receive uh, Du Bois' work when he went to Paris? So the European press does refer to it kind of in passing, which would have been certainly a compliment considering their own kind of uh, racial prejudice, um, but they definitely refer to it more willingly. So one can only assume there were, again, there were 56 million people that came to the exposition over the roughly eight to 10 months. So there was a lot of people there. And you can imagine that the reaction probably would have spanned uh, the gamut from outrage to delight. 
Um, there was actually a number of African-American leaders in the US that went to Paris to witness this for themselves. And again, I, I mentioned this, that the African-American press, there's a number of kind of like black papers and things like that reported on it widely. And those are where we actually can get a lot of the nuance and uh, 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 firsthand accounts of how it was received. Uh, again, plenty more research to do on uncovering all of that. Um, but the reality is that we don't have any personal reflections of someone who was there that was not a part of that team. Um, there have been, as far as I understand, and, and I've looked, <laughs> but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist out there, no firsthand accounts of, oh, I went to the 1800 exposition and this was really amazing. Um, even in the actual documentation of the funding, the government report that actually goes through like a spreadsheet to say this is where the money went, ignores it from the US. So like they deeply covered this up because they just did not care. Right. The prejudice of the time, right? Um, all right. Well, I have another question for you. Um, how do we advocate um, for minority groups, right, or underrepresented groups using his scholarship or any type of scholarship that has to do with data viz and data visualization as well as data analytics? Any recommendation you have for us on Thank furthering you. this work in academia and in the industry? In, in, I mean, it's a phrase from other African Americans, but include black voices. You know, like this is a story that has to be lots of people coming together, but we need to cherish, embrace, educate, learn, lift up, amplify black voices. It's, it's a fundamental to who we are as a people, especially at this moment. And you know what? We're gonna make a bunch of mistakes. We're gonna put data out there that's probably not as good as it could be, but that's okay because we have to, the effort's too important for us not to try. So. Thank you. And I think you answered a couple of the questions that was asked here. Um, one final question from the audience. Michael, do you wanna ask any other questions before I take one more from the audience? Well, maybe, maybe just to build on that last comment, Jason, I think a number of our colleagues are interested. In, I think we actually have some guests from Black Tide. So I wanna oh, shout wonderful. out to Black Tides, uh, which is a wonderful organization representing a lot of people of color in technology and data, et cetera. So um, I do think that there are a lot of questions perhaps our students themselves would have, which was, you know, how do you build greater representation of them as practitioners? Perhaps slightly different question to Lillian's uh, about, you know, is, is what, what, what work do you see? I mean, put you on the spot. What actively are you doing as somebody as a hirer of analytic talent and a developer of analytic talent? What can we do? as a university, you know, to really ensure that, um, you know, who is in the room is representative when we're coming to developing these stories. Most important point is stay vigilant, right? Black History Month is nice. It's great to get some months where we change our programming to focus specifically on African-American voices, but that's not enough, right? It should be all year round. We should be making sure, not only just by providing more photos, but just by remembering right? That's what the data is. It's the world as it exists, not the world that we want it to be, right? Um, so vigilance. And, you know, I have, uh, for Nightingale, uh, we do have several people of color on our staff. It's important for us to make sure that we have a representation. And it's even more this year, I can't talk about it just 100% yet, but we're going to be trying to create more initiatives to find more uh, BIPOC writers, uh, practitioners that we can help support and lift up and ultimately help them get jobs, right? It gets, it, it's vigilance. The, when one word, the answer is vigilance. Stay vigilant. I, I also encourage anybody who's on the call who feels, uh, we've muted you all, which is a terrible metaphor for something, but uh, uh, if anybody who actually feels like they uh, would like to add a comment about this, if you could pop it in the Q&A, uh, I certainly and the other panelists will see it. We can reflect it out. We can add um, some notes. You know, so if there are organizations, resources, etc., in this space that you think, um, you know, other people on the call may be interested in, just pop a note in the Q and A, and and we'll try and amplify that. So, um, yeah, I I think this has been extraordinary. Perhaps. Uh, 
Lillian will will draw to a close. I, I think you know we're at a good time. I like to try and land these things. You know, with with the uh, with the seven minutes of terror in mind from yesterday's Mars landing. I I want to try and <laughs> keep us um, you know keep us on time and landing landing perfectly. So we're 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 now uh, we've now just put the parachute out, Jason, and we're slowing down. So, uh, but no, I do want to thank you both and our panelists for animating an extraordinary conversation as i as i've said you, the um you know i think it was it was heartening to me to see that we got naturally into these questions of humanizing data and you know data with empathy and data storytelling and 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 clearly du bois's work was uh you know very explicit about um the stories about human conditions that he was trying to tell both both the the positive story of growth and advancement but also you know, to highlight some of the inequities and, and um, you know, that, that clearly must be this, the sort of uh, promise or, um, you know, the, the, the charge we all take up. And I know having looked at some of the work of Tim and, and Chris and John and others, you know, I think they're very, very engaged in that exact, uh, you know, different aspects of their work, but really trying to use data and data visualization to highlight some of these disparities uh, you know, in, in a way that's, uh, you know, perhaps more easy to recognize than, you know, a story in a newspaper, you know, a visual has that kind of appeal. So I, I want to thank you all for uh, your time and engagement on this and, and particularly Jason and Lillian for helping us sort of navigate through an extraordinary body of work. Uh, we've put out some links in the uh, chat to two books uh, that are published um, uh, you know, the one quite recently um, uh, from, I think it's from uh, University of Massachusetts, where they have the collection, uh, a collection of these articles, and, and then an earlier book by Eugene Provenzo that's worth reading, and links out also to Jason's article or series of articles in Medium, uh, it, sorry, in Nightingale, which is part of Medium. So if you are able to look in the Q&As, uh, please, please do so, you'll see that, but we'll send it around with the, the chat. So. I, I'm going to transition for two seconds, uh, Julie, uh, Julia Potapoff, if you want to put up a, a slide. Uh, this is the shameless advertorial, you know, a word from your sponsors or something like that. Um, we, we, we clearly uh, look forward to hearing from anyone on this call uh, who's interested in further debate and discussion. And uh, I should probably have added my emails, but uh, I and Tim Savage and Chris Gaffney and John Kane, probably fairly easy to find via LinkedIn. But if you're interested in any of the actual programs that we talked about, um, then there are, you know, names of the schools up here and sort of uh, not bit.ly, I don't know what, RBGY links, the new bit.ly, uh, some sort of shortened URL links um, that you can follow uh, emails for our admissions. This deck will be sent to everybody, yes. So we will, we will email this uh, presentation uh, down if you didn't uh, screenshot or scribble down these things. But um, I just want to let you know, we'd be more than delighted to continue this conversation. And as I think I indicated, there are many, many programs across the school, some we didn't even get a chance to, to mention, and, and many of them not just degree programs, you know, you can come in and do a short six week course on data visualization or a you know, or a longer certificate over a couple of semesters around analytics. But there's a, there's a ton of really good stuff going on at the School of Professional Studies in this space. Uh, and, and I think also, you know, as, as, as we have been for our whole history, a very diverse, inclusive community that's focused on access and, um, you know, and inclusion. So a, a great place to study, I think, among other like-minded people. So uh, shameless plug over. Uh, many, many thanks to all of us on the panel and to Julia and Bonnie who helped make this possible and um, signing off. I'm going to leave this slide up for a second. Oh, no, nope. maybe not. Uh, anyway, goodbye to all of you and many, many thanks. All right. Bye-bye.